Today, I'm taking the best of far-flung shores and bringing it all back home. Expect Thai, American and Turkish flavours, which I'll be recreating into hearty British grub. Hello and welcome to Pies and Puds. I'm on a mission to celebrate the best of Britain's comfort food and here's what's on my menu today. Coming up, I make a wonderfully fragrant Thai chicken pie. Wow. <laughs> Using exotic herbs and spices grown in the most unexpected place. Just mental. I'm from Yorkshire. I take a field trip to learn about all things pumpkin. What is that? and I plump for one to use in my pumpkin and ginger cheesecake. Look at the colour in there. It's beautiful, it's beautiful. It's so orange, nice, isn't it? isn't it? I learned the art of making Turkish delight with some amazing flavour combinations. This is Earl Grey. Mm, it's quite refreshing, that one, as well. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> and a rice pudding war breaks out as I make my classic recipe. Oh, this one's been around in the family for a while, actually. And my guest, Merle, answers with her own version of the dish. And you reckon yours against mine? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> my first recipe is a cheesecake with an exciting flavour combination of pumpkin and stem ginger. For most people, pumpkin is just a Halloween thing, or maybe the occasional bowl of pumpkin soup or pie. But this bulbous veg has hidden depths, as I discovered. Mark and Verity Bachelor have been growing pumpkins in the North Kent countryside for the last six years and turned themselves into pumpkin heroes. But I'm here today to find out a little bit more about this seasonal veg. I'm not just here today on a fact-finding mission, I also need to pick a pumpkin to use in my cheesecake. We've got 16 different varieties. Of that, seven are the traditional orange, yeah. um, and the other ones are varying other colours, multicoloured, some of them. Are they a short-growing crop, then? How long does it take to, to grow, start to finish? We plant the seeds in May, um, and, um, and they're ready to harvest by beginning of September. And do you enjoy pumpkins? you cook with pumpkin? I do cook with pumpkin. It's still new to us, uh, you know, the um, finding the right ones for the right dishes. They're all edible, but they all they some are of them all are edible. Than cooking. Absolutely, and some I think are literally produced for the look of them. You know, we've had inquiries about uh, white pumpkins for weddings, that sort of thing. So it, there, there's a big market for pumpkins other than just eating them. What is that? <laughs> It's just a decorative gourd. OK. That's going to be the strangest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. That looks like a cottage loaf. <laughs> That's weird. That's a squash. Yes. The pumpkin really is a versatile vegetable. Beyond your more obvious soups, purees and pies, it's also great in breads, puddings, risottos and pasta. What's it taste like? Quite a sweet taste, so a very, yeah, really enjoyed that one. Well, that's interesting. I had no idea there were so many different colours, varieties, sizes. I just thought pumpkin were all sort of this big and that's it, but they're like something out of another planet. Speaking of other planets, I've heard there's a pumpkin lurking somewhere here that has extraterrestrial qualities. Look at the size of it. Looks like a mutant. It's the mutant <laughs> You'd spend hours carving that, couldn't you? And this one I'd planted out, forgotten about it, didn't do anything with it, and that's the honest truth. Came out one day and thought, oh, that's working. Oh, I'm not even going to help you. There's just no way. Is this then, is this the biggest one you've grown? This is the biggest one that I've grown. If we'd had a warmer spring, we could have probably, hopefully, have grown a bigger pumpkin. So. Next year, the challenge is on again. Actually, you could, you could sort of carve it into a nice chair for your house, couldn't you? I'm looking over there, and I can see not a coconut shy, but a pumpkin shy. It, it is a pumpkin shy. The children love it. But... I'm a bit of a kid. Can I have a go? Yeah, no, sure. 
<laughs> well done. <laughs> well, I did say I was a big kid. I love driving tractors. She should have been a farmer, not a baker. She should have been a farmer. Enough of the fun and games. I've got some serious tasting to do. So, show me the pumpkins. Verity has lined up an impressive harvest to taste. They come in all shapes and sizes, but I'm on the lookout for something sweet. OK, so we've got all our pumpkins lined up. We have. Um, neatly like soldiers. The reason why I wanted to come here to check out the pumpkins, first of all, I was astonished by the variety that you've got, and again here. But it's for me to pick a pumpkin to go with my cheesecake. So what's the first pumpkin that we have here? This is Moonscape. It's got a bit of sweetness to it. It has. It's quite fibrous, I think. I think that would go really well roasted with um, a Sunday roast. Mm. Speckled hound. Speckled hound. Nice texture. This is the more conventional pumpkin. Yeah. Fibrous, mm. quite sinewy. Mm. Uh, what was this one again? Snowman. Snowman. It's a good eat. It's moist. I must find it too watery. I've eaten pumpkin before, but these taste as different as they look, each with a very texture and an earthiness. The next one has a very promising name. What's this one? This is um, small sugar. Mmm. A lot sweeter. Mmm, it is a lot sweeter. This is a new variety. We, haven't, we didn't grow this last year, so this is the first time of, um, of trying it. That's the guy I'm going to put in my cheesecake. Would you agree with that? I think that's a good choice. Remember, a pumpkin is for baking, not just for carving. I'm joined by our pumpkin farmers, Mark and Verity, who have brought the key ingredient for my pumpkin and ginger cheesecake. Do you know what the best part of that day was? Go on. Trying to lift that massive pumpkin in that field. <laughs> and he broke me back. Is it still there? Is it still OK? No, it went to the show for the heaviest pumpkin, and um, did it, you did, win? it did win. It did win. And I took a second one just to make sure that I came second as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so, fantastic. Yeah. So where is it now, then? It's currently on the farm, sitting, waiting for show when people come to the farm. I think it's amazing. Now, we decided to use the, um, the little sugar, wasn't it, which was the... the small sugar, the, yes. The small sugar, that's right, the small sugar pumpkin to go inside the cheesecake I'm going to make. Now, is that, that's the small sugar, isn't it? It is. Now, which one do you reckon I should use? This one? Yeah, that looks good. I mean, the colour, it's more like a classic pumpkin, isn't it? It is. It is. It's slightly more ridged than some of the other ones that we that we grow, but it's, uh, yeah, it's your classic pumpkin. Look at the colour in there. Beautiful, it's beautiful. It's so orange, nice, isn't it? isn't it? It's so good. Now, what I'm going to make is a ginger and pumpkin cheesecake, and I hope it does your pumpkin justice. I can't wait to try yeah. it. Remove the skin from the pumpkin and chop it into cubes. It's not quite like doing a, um, in a melon. It's a little bit more harder than that. You've got to watch your fingers. You have. Add butter and sugar with stem ginger syrup to infuse the flavour into the pumpkin flesh. So the whole thing together will go into a roasting oven and basically set it around 200. It'll take about 15, 20 minutes just to break that down. Well, realistically, it might take slightly less. It depends. You need to get that nice and soft. Now, that'll go straight into the oven. So what you end up with are beautiful tender pieces of pumpkin in the ginger syrup and then the butter. It's almost making its own little toffee. Now, that goes to one side. I'm making individual cheesecakes, but you can always make a large one to share. Now, the base, I'm using just rings here with silicon paper at the bottom of the tray. Now, I'm going to use ginger biscuits, which I've crushed, popped that into a bowl. And over here, I've got some melted butter. Add that to the, to the ginger nuts, mix it round, just to form a little bit of a paste. I've seen people who use all types of biscuits, but I think ginger works actually quite well. Get a little blob, drop it to the bottom of each one, as the cheesecake sets in the fridge, the butter will harden and firm up the bases. For the filling, start by whipping up some double cream. 
So when you've actually got your pumpkin at home, is there any way of sort of keeping it nice and shiny and keeping it looking its best? Get the soil off it. Don't put any chips in it, cuts in it or anything, and keep it in a cool environment that's got an airflow. So you, you don't advise putting furniture polish on it, then? Uh, not unless you like the taste of it. But you're not going to eat the skin, are you? No, but I wouldn't put it on there. I put furniture polish on that, give it a nice big shine. Or a bit of Vaseline. Again, that'll shine it all up, make it look really good. Into your whisk cream, add natural yoghurt and cream cheese. I've got some stem ginger here, which I'm going to slice into little pieces. I love stem ginger, don't you? Mm. Tip the pumpkin and the juices into a processor and blitz to create a smooth pumpkin paste. OK, happy with that. So what you've got is, is that sort of consistency, nice and soft and all bit pulpy, but got a bit of body to it as well. Now that will go into your mixture here. And basically just stir it round. I don't want to mix it in. I, was, I want to cause a, almost a form of ripple through it. Now, that'll do. So what you've got is all your bits of cream, your filly all mixed together with the yoghurt, and then streaks of the pumpkin. So when you hit it, you're going to taste it. Bring back your, the rings with the ginger nut base on it, and then start scooping out the filling and dropping it inside the ring, pushing it down all the way. A little bit more in there. You can see that pumpkin. Once you've filled your cheesecake moulds, or tin if you're making a larger one, put them into the fridge for a couple of hours to set, or even better, overnight. And it comes out looking not too dissimilar to that. You should be able to just pop it all the way through from the ring. Just push it up. There's one. All right, I think I've got an idea to make my life a little bit easier. Let's get a little spice jar, pop it over there, and that should bring it out a little bit easier. I think what I'll do to really heighten that pumpkin flavour, just pipe a little bit of pumpkin in the middle there, just to let everybody know what they're eating. Crystallised ginger here as well. Cut off some shavings of that. Pop that on there as well. That certainly tells you what it is. They look absolutely delicious. Got a real smell of the ginger. It's got everything in there, hasn't mm. it? So what you have there is ginger and pumpkin cheesecake. This creamy cheesecake comes with a zingy ginger kick for an extra special treat served with vanilla or ginger ice cream. Now, guys, you'll have to wait a little bit longer before we get a chance to eat it. Looking forward to it. Coming up, East meets West in my Thai chicken pie. You smell oh. it straight away, can't you? Oh, it's, it's, it's instant. <laughs> I'll be showing a Hollywood classic. Yeah. It's rice pudding. And I'm more than happy to lend a helping hand. You want to put the milk in? <laughs> you want to do this? Turkish delight has been around even longer than me, since the 1700s, they reckon. We commonly know it as an exotic treat, but my next guest is reinterpreting it for Britain. Welcome, Mel. Mel Mustafa makes Turkish delight using her Cypriot father's original recipe. They are corn flour and sugar syrup sweets, which I know and love from my time living in Cyprus. Now, there's lots of different colours here, and I take it lots of different flavours. Yeah. Which one's this one with the nuts Walnuts. in? Walnuts. Walnuts. Oh, yeah. Which, actually, in Cyprus, mm. that's, like, the main flavour, actually. There's walnuts everywhere. Mm. In Turkey and Cyprus, specialist shops sell Turkish delights, made with family recipes handed down through the generations. 
Should you do a lemon one or a citrus one? Let's try this one. This is actually a Cypriot orange flower blossom. Um, and it's been distilled here, though. That just tastes like Cyprus, I think, or mm. the Mediterranean. It does. It's... It does indeed. It's yeah. taking me right back. Yeah. The food heritage is incredible, whether yeah. it's from the Greek side or whether it's oh, from the definitely. Turkish side. But Merle has given this sweet treat her own twist by creating some unusual flavours infused with the English countryside. Got geranium. Uh, I do still like to do... Geranium? <laughs> can I try this? You can. It's quite subtle, that one. But I've got English rose and this one's got petals in it. It's slightly chewier than I expected. Is that your interpretation of it? Mm, I think it should be a bit chewy. <laughs> it is. <laughs> This is Earl Grey. You might like that's quite a nice one. Mm, because that's we're a nation of tea drinkers, so I thought, well, Earl Grey with the bergamot. It's funny, you can't smell it at all, can you? It's Got quite subtle. Well, with most of them, you don't get the flavours straight away. They come through kind of afterwards. Mm. Can you I'm get that? that? I'm get, it's right at the end. Mm. But yeah, I'm definitely getting that. It's quite refreshing, that one as well. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> mm. They're delicious. Do you know what it goes well with? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what it does? Because of the sugar in there and the glucose, as soon as you drink warm tea, it just sort of melts and actually heightens the flavour. Yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah, it that? is nice with a cup of actually. It's delicious. And what? Which, which one's this one? These I think are... that's that's just the rose one. Inspired by Turkish rose water, Mel has even created English rose flavours. English roses taste. Much different. I know they changed they it. Which one's the English one then? Is that this one? That one's more of an instant hit. Yeah. That one's a lot more subtle, subtle. Than, than that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Because that one is, it seems to be a purer, cleaner yeah, flavour. It's definitely cleaner. The fact that you're bringing that, those flavours in from this country and infusing it into Turkish, yeah. I think it works. Thank you. So you're going to show us um, how you make your Turkish delights? I am, yeah. OK, so please take over my kitchen. <laughs> if you want me to know anything, let me know. All right. It's all there. OK, well, I thought I'd make a lemon verbena one. These leaves here, which have got the best smell ever, they're just so oh, lovely, yes. so lovely. So I thought that'd be a good one That's to a do. One, yeah. That. Lemon verbena is a fragrant garden herb used in cooking for its lemon flavour. Might be a sherbet lemons. Yeah, it is a bit like that, yeah. <laughs> Mel uses it to give a sugar syrup a citrus kick. And you just cook that for about 15 minutes on a sort of rolling boil, I suppose. Okay, yeah. Right, the next stage is in a big heavy base pan, you've got to make up some corn flour mixed with a bit of cream and tartar to mm -hmm. stop it going really gloopy, and water. Yeah. Um, you just cook that for a little bit, and then it's just a matter of adding the syrup to the corn flour. Which is the worst part, really. Right, because that's where everything <laughs> goes horribly everything wrong. Everything go wrong, yeah. Where do you make all these? Where? In my kitchen. In your kitchen? Yeah. At home? Yeah, yeah. Dear me, does it's that little... take up your whole kitchen? Uh, it takes up quite a lot of room, yeah. It's quite a small company, because it's basically just me making it. Mm -hmm. So, um... I like that, though. It's that small artisan touch. Yeah. So, the whole thing is, once, that, once that's begun to slacken down and loosen yeah. off, you then add the syrup to that. Yeah. Does that syrup have to be um, a specific temperature? Um, well, I kind of go by colour, really, okay. rather than temperature. So uh, I'd say a pale gold golden is about the right colour. I'm happy to give Mel a hand. Heated sugar syrup can be dangerous. Keep the kids well away if you try this at home. Do you want to start yeah, tipping this Yeah, if you in? could add in small amounts. Make sure you use a heavy base pan for this job, as the mixture needs some serious beating. Basically, you've just got to really get the syrup into the corn flour. Do we have a go? Go on, then, please. Yeah, Thank you. Speed. <laughs> I, always, I always think that. Give it a good beating. So I've obviously not got the muscle power, I think. Go on, add some more of that. Go on, straight in. Right, mind your arm. Go on. Yeah. That'll do. It's, so it's, beginning to, it's beginning to slacken down a bit, isn't it? Yeah, that's brilliant. And it, it's much easier to kind of. Yeah, it does work get easier. Because you're slacking down. I'm not, it's got a strange smell. It's, it's a bit like caramel, but it's not it, as potent it as caramel. It is a bit like caramel. Is that more that's how it really should good. be? Yeah, that's brilliant. 
That's perfect. So you carry on stirring this for 10 minutes, yeah. and then you cook it out for 10 minutes, and then this mixture, which, yeah. which would be nice and thick, I'd imagine, yeah. by then. What happens to it then? Um, it's then poured into a tin. It's been lined with cling film and oiled. This one here that's still quite hot. Now, this colour here is what it turns into. Yeah, it's a kind of golden... Yeah. ..a golden colour. It can be slightly darker as well. Yeah. The, the darker, the more chewy. I think right. it goes. Okay. So that's the thing about homemade, it varies every time you make it very slightly. So you because get a you chewy or sometimes it just totally melts. spot on, but I quite like that. Pour the mix into the tin. You, you spread out, do you? Or yeah, it, find its own it, level? it will kind of find its own level. And leave to set overnight. So this is ready to cut now. Aha. Uh -huh. Then um, just chop it up. And with the knife being oiled, it should get through quite easily. Uh, Sometimes it's a bit more sticky than that, yeah. and so it's a bit more difficult to cut, but you just basically cut chop pieces it off. up, yeah, and into your corn flour and icing sugar mixture. Once you've coated it, then you realise that, yeah, that's, that's, it. that's it. And, um, and the longer you leave it in the icing sugar, I mean, because it, it's fresh, it won't store for a long time. Mm. But it, it will absorb that icing sugar and it will get a little bit sweeter because it's actually not very sweet at the moment. Mm. But once it's left in that for a bit, it will get a bit sweeter. Well, how long? Is there a peak? Is it like wine? It sort um, of peaks and then drops off? Yeah, or? I'd say when it's about a week old, it's really nice because it's had time to sit in that, flat, uh, that icing sugar. This is what I love. People taking the trouble to experiment with food like Merle does. She's creating new flavours and turning them into true Turkish delights. Merle joins me again later when we both make our own family rice pudding recipes. It's very different. It is, isn't it? My next recipe looks like a good old British pie, but it's filled with oriental flavours. I love a good Thai chicken curry, fragrant with spices, chilli and ginger. You might think those spicy flavourings have to be imported from some exotic faraway place, but these days, that's not necessarily so. Robert Ramsden is an importer of exotic herbs and vegetables. The only problem is he doesn't want to import them, so he's on a mission to get farmers and producers to grow exotic food right here in Yorkshire. This is grown in Gummersall. It's a box of mixed living cress. Uh, there's different varieties, different flavours of cress. Previously, we used to have to bring it back from Holland uh, in mass. We used to be bringing back 100 plus boxes per night. Robert has even managed to source coriander seeds in Yorkshire. Now, these are something really different, something really unique. Uh, you probably won't see these anywhere, really. Uh, you can see little green balls of joy, and when you squeeze them, they pop, and the flavour is absolutely insane. It's perfect for Thai green curries, etc. perfect for uh, putting through your kind of water if you're steaming fish, really perfumey, and uh, they're just mental, and they're from Yorkshire. Robert's had great success working with herb grower Alison Dodd. Alison grows key ingredients for Thai cuisine, including lemongrass, which is usually imported from tropical Asia. Together, they're going to forage for the herbs and spices I need for my Thai chicken pie. They're quite surprising to find in Yorkshire, which is this uh, lemongrass. Chefs in the UK are used to dry lemongrass stalks, but Alison supplies fresh green leaves. It doesn't look like lemongrass. No, it doesn't, because uh, when you get it in from Thailand normally, you've got all the leaves have been cut off. Right. But the leaves actually are extremely uh, flavoursome. And um, yeah. yeah, they're good, aren't they? Fantastic. How we look at it as a company is to find things that previously we've had to import, like lemongrass, for example. It comes all the way from Thailand. It travels many, many miles. It's prepared. It comes in a sleeve. Finding someone that is prepared to grow it for us and understand it, it ain't got the air miles. It's helping the environment. It's helping all parties, really. Yeah, some chefs have sent, you know, phoned up and said, why have you sent me the leaves? Well, because the leaves are delicious. And um, 
they add quite a lot to a dish, you know what? especially to Paul's uh, curry pie. Would so be I'm good. Say, Paul's going to love this. Absolutely. Alison has managed to grow exotic flavours outside too. Look at this. Right, Robert. This is the coriander you might need. Fantastic. Previously, we've had to buy coriander, and it's come all the way from Israel. It's grown all the way over in wherever. Finding someone who can grow it over here is really important. Even the local curry house now is looking to source UK produce where possible. Alison has been growing another herb that will add a welcome twist to my Thai pie. Right, I've got a last little surprise for you for this right. for this curry pie. What is it? A Thai basil. Really? Mm. Fantastic. Which is uh, delicious, isn't it? <laughs> That's unbelievable. That'll just do the job. That I'll love that. Yep, just finishes it off, doesn't it? It's perfect. It's very, very good. Paul's idea for a Thai curry pie is a fantastic thing. You know, it's bringing the Asian influence into what he's trying to do. He's putting it in a pie, which is very, very British. We all love a really decent pie. And we're here in these amazing surroundings. We've got lemongrass, we've got coriander, we've got Thai basil, all grown in Yorkshire. Alison and Rob have brought their bounty of exotic herbs for my fragrant pie. One of the things I, I, I loved about watching that was the fact that, Rob, I mean, you're an importer of exotic, you know, flavoured spices. Yeah. And the fact that it was you yourself thought, so, hang on a minute, we must be able to grow some of this in this country. That's it. I think it's embracing with someone like Alison to bring stuff back to the country, and especially to Yorkshire, mm. and to celebrate the season and what the uses are and what the chefs and the customers can do with it, really. I mean, for me, the big thing, uh, having lived in Cyprus for such a long time, Coriander was like a weed. I mean, it just grows everywhere. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, it's unbelievable. And it is difficult to grow in this country. No, not at all. Really? No. I mean, we, why We grow it... acres of it. Really? Yes. And with, it, you don't have to tunnel it, it's exposed? No, not at all. No, we're growing it really from about uh, the end of April, beginning of May, right the way through to end of October. So is there anything that you think, I'd love to grow that here, but we just, we just can't? Yeah, I mean, there's things like ginger, obviously a fantastic flavour, which we all know. But it needs a lot of heat, a lot of dryness to grow and get that heat inside the root. Um, so we can't really grow that in Yorkshire. We're always going to need to import pineapples and bananas and grapes and lettuce out of season. There's always going to be that need and that demand. Um, but while we've got the sun and while we've got the, the season for it, if we can get it grown over here, then I think we should be quite proud of it, really. Well, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm amazed, actually. Yorkshire, I'm going to have to come up with my shorts next time. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting this exotic place <laughs> with 40 degrees sunshine. Yeah, no, I'm, going to say, right, I'm going to Yorkshire for my holiday. <laughs> Now, I'm going to be using lemongrass, and I see you've got some lemongrass there. Yes, well, fresh lemongrass is, is really good, and uh, the leaves are usually fantastic, but I'm afraid it's just a bit of the end of the season, so I wasn't able to bring great long leaves of, of lemongrass as well. But, uh, yes, it knocks spots off the imported stuff. But flavour-wise? It's very good, and it's fresh. And anything that's fresh has got to be better than stuff that's travelled forever from the other side of the world. Okay. I'm going to use it anyway in the dish. Well, that's good. So I'm hoping it, you know, that flavour comes through to infuse this. <laughs> well, so there's sure no that. pressure at all. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so can you run through what else we've got here then? We've got coriander seed. It's a different variety of the of the edible herb, um, and these pod into little seeds. And basically, if you rub them in your fingers and smell them, they're really intense, really lemony, really citrus. This is grown in Leeds. Oh. I mean, that's obviously the dried variety there. Yeah. So there's a complete flavour hit. Do you dry the coriander seeds out yourself? Uh, yeah, we can do, yeah. The chefs tend to buy them like that, pick the flowers off, cos the flowers are really intense, and then they'll dry them. Yeah. Long may it rain. Long may Yorkshire carry on with their exotic flavours. Yeah. We love it. And Kent. And <laughs> Cheshire. And Lancashire. <laughs> and the Midlands. No. Come on, pull your finger out. <laughs> Right, what I'm going to do now is your favourite chicken Thai dish and I'm going to put a beautiful pastry on the top of it. But this time I'm going to do it with a traditional Thai food, so it's going to be chicken Thai. Now, if you run through the ingredients here, and I've got some dried coriander seeds here. Now, Rob, can you pick off some of the fresh yeah, stuff as definitely. well? I'm going to pop some of that in a pestle and mortar. Wow. <laughs> You can, smell, you can, it smell smell. good. Yeah, hang on. Yeah. Smell this. It's a lot better than the dried. It's it. Well, it's a it's a blend of. Oh, stop! <laughs> this is this is the blend of both, right? Hang on. I can smell it from here. Smell that. Oh, it's, it's both. Wonderful. 
That's fantastic, isn't it? It's lovely, isn't it? I spice my pie using fresh red chilli. Just add more or less, depending on how much heat you can take. Into the pan it goes with the banana shallot, which I've chopped up. I've got garlic going in there as well, of course. Something you don't grow in Yorkshire. No, 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 we do grow garlic. garlic. Yes, we do. We, we do. have it as green, green garlic, so it's yes. like a spring onion. Yeah, yeah. And then you can use everything, right, from top, from bottom to top. And then as it bulbs up, we get wet garlic. And then as it dries, obviously, we've got dry garlic. And then we've got 12 months of it, yeah. What I'm doing is adding some root ginger to this as well. Yeah, That's unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Add green Thai curry paste into the banana shallots and red chilli. You smell what? it straight away, can't you? Oh, it's, 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 it's instant, yeah. yeah. Then add the chicken. I've used breast and thighs. It's cooking off nicely now. This in a pie. I think it's the best of both worlds for me. <laughs> I was a bit surprised at first to think you were putting pastry on top of a, a Thai curry, basically. Well, why not? Well, why not? That's what I thought. When I kind of sat back and thought, well, why not, precisely? When the chicken is browned, add stock, coconut milk, fish sauce, lime leaves and some sweet potato. How do you cope with lime leaves in Yorkshire? Well, I've just started to grow some, but it's going to be a long time before they're ready. Oh, really? But I've just discovered from Rob today there's somebody growing them in Kent, would there you is. believe? Yeah, there you go, you see. There is. My adopted <laughs> yeah. county's already in there. I only found that out about two days ago as well, and they are absolutely <laughs> I've fantastic. I've been looking for them everywhere, so it's yeah. really good to know, actually. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Got some lemongrass. I'm going to crush it and throw that straight in. Now, the whole thing is now in the pan. Now, this will take about 20 minutes and then pop it in the fridge and leave it to cool. Now, I've got a cold one in the fridge. No, it's not a beer. It's the inside of the pie, which has been chilled. Now, you've got some basil leaves there, some interesting basil leaves, Yes, there's you? Thai basil here, actually. We grow ah. lots of different basil. Can I take some of these? Please do. It's got a fantastic scent on it. And this is one you just started growing as well, yes, isn't it? Yes, yes. Make the short crust pastry for the pie by adding butter and lard to some flour. So you rub this together. Once it's been rubbed together, you squeeze a lemon juice. Again, helps break down that flour, keeps it nice and crumbly. This is a short crust pastry. And then a little pinch of salt, water, mix that all together into form of paste. You may need to sort of knead it literally five, ten seconds. That's it, just to build up enough gluten to hold it together. Now, over here, I've got my pastry, and this is my tin. So I'm just going to put the filling in to start with, spread that flavour dish all over the bottom so it's nice and even. I'm not going to line the tin with pastry, as my pie filling is quite moist. No one likes a soggy bottom. Now, this is going to form a little rim around the outside so I can bomb the lid to the top. Take it all the way around. So what I'm going to do is just make sure this is nice and it's good to go. It's nice and pliable. A little bit of flour. I'm going to roll out the... Always have one, two, three for good luck. Now, what I've got, once you've rolled it out, my new favourite bit of kit is this. Da -da. This is a great little thing, this. I used to have one, a massive one of this. It's probably nearly double the width in a professional bakery. But all you do is run across the, the pastry and basically just use your cutter, cut all the way through, and then place your dough over the top. Just open it up a little bit with your fingers as you stretch it over. And then tack it down right to the edge using that rim that you put round of the pastry. That looks fantastic. Open it up a little bit using a knife. It takes a little bit of time, but it's worth it because it just looks so attractive. Trim round the outside. Brush with a beaten egg for a golden colour and put it in the oven for 30 minutes at 200 degrees Celsius. There you have it. You have your chicken Thai 
pie with a beautiful pastry lid on the top using all the exotic flavours and ingredients from... Yorkshire. From Yorkshire. Well, let's be honest, it could come from Kent, <laughs> Midlands, anywhere in the country. This warming Thai chicken pie comes with a crispy pastry lid to dip in that fragrant curry sauce. Now, guys, you're going to have to wait a little bit later to try this. Yeah, can't Fantastic. wait. Fantastic. Wait we're for mad, it to cool down a we're bit. We're mad for a good pie, so <laughs> excited. <laughs> Next, Mel returns to my kitchen as we make our own versions of rice pudding. Mine is a Hollywood family recipe, and Mel's is a traditional Turkish dish. And you reckon yours against mine? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm up for the challenge. You know, I'm up for the challenge. But we'll I give it a go. It. I'm going to try it anyway. Okay. And then you can try mine, and I'll try yours a bit oh, later as well. Sounds fantastic. OK. Thank All you. Right. My own family rice pudding recipe is simple and quick to make. So I'm going to do mine very quickly. Again, rice goes into the dish. And then the milk goes on top of that. The next thing I'm going to add is my butter. Where's your recipe from, is it? Oh, this okay. one's been around in the family for a while, actually. But, you know, can I, can I tell you the truth? I never really used to like them. And then I used to sort of change it a lot, you know, yeah. and adapt it. And yeah, that's what that's generally what, happens. Yeah. So I've got butter in there, I've got sugar in there. Then I'm going to add some milk powder. And, again, this heightens the flavour of it as well. Again, this is the un un unusual bit, yeah, really. Yeah, I'd never have thought of putting milk powder Put in there. Put milk powder in there. Then I've got a little bit of nutmeg on the top. Fresh nutmeg always goes down a treat. And then the last thing to go in is a lemon. Now, I'm going to try and cut off the... Just take off some of the skin. You go around the whole lemon, taking off the skin, leaving it in there. I think it infuses such a nice flavour yeah. into it. But obviously, when you meet it in a dish, you just pull it out yeah. and leave it to one side. While my rice pudding goes in the oven at 150 degrees Celsius for two hours, Mel is going to cook her Turkish version of rice pudding. Right, that's me done, Mel. How about yourself? <laughs> It'll take me a lot longer. <laughs> really? Right, yeah. It's rice it's, pudding. I know, okay, but go ahead. Turkish things take ages. <laughs> Right, I've got um, some pudding rice and it's already been cooked for yep. about 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and then just bring some milk to the boil. I normally do a pint. Right. And then to that I add some sugar, yep. some mastika. I know mastika. It's a it? spice, really, that comes from uh, the Greek islands, doesn't it? Yeah. It's very aniseed, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. It's quite pungent. If you can't get hold of mastika, use perno or aniseed flavouring instead. And then you put some double cream. Double cream, yeah. Yeah. And then a little bit of rose water, but not too much. How much do you put in? Um, I'd say just over half a teaspoon. OK. So, do that. Cos when it's cold, it, it's quite strong. Yeah. So... And that's my locally distilled rose water. Lovely, <laughs> lovely. Right, and then you, you've got to stir that to dissolve it. Yeah. A bit. What goes in next? Right, next, got... we've got to make up a mixture of cornflour and milk. I'll put that there. You could do this bit if you want. You want to put the milk in? <laughs> you want to do this? This mastika, you've got, to, you've got to kind of let it melt because otherwise it just stays all lumpy. So that goes in there. The cornflour and milk mixture acts as a thickener in Mel's recipe. Then just bring that to the boil, let it thicken a little bit, yeah. and then the rice can go in. What about this? What about the uh, right lemon zest? Lemon. When, when you've done your ten minutes, you just grate your lemon zest into there. So just... after ten minutes, it goes like that. Yeah. And then the lemon zest goes into that. Yep. So it does look good. Not. I'm actually going to be very much. different in flavour with the rose water and the mastika yeah. and the lemon as well. The strong lemon. Yeah, that's probably enough, I think. Okay. And then it goes into that dish, and then you put it in the fridge. It's very different. It is, isn't it? Yeah. It's amazing what you can do with a bit yeah, of rice, isn't it? OK, do you want to pop that in there? Yeah. Looks good. It's very clean looking, isn't it? Yeah. Some people, not everybody, do like a, a burnt top on it, so you flame the top or grill the top so mm -hmm. that it goes nice and brown. I think 
the easiest way to get a nice even colour is a blowtorch. OK. I've got a blowtorch. Good. That's a serious pain, just yeah. want a blowtorch. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. A grill will do the job if you don't have a blowtorch handy. And you get, like, big bubbles coming Yeah, up. I can see that. Like that sort of thing? Yeah. Fantastic. OK, so that's your... Sutlach. That's your sutlach. Yeah. Mill's Turkish pudding is traditionally served cold and a creme caramel finish gives it a deeper, toasty flavour. And there is my British rice pudding, which I would normally serve with jam. Wow, that looks amazing. I think that Earl Grey would go really well with that rice pudding. Earl Grey rice pudding. Yeah, yeah. I can do that. OK, <laughs> there's my classic British rice pudding with Earl Grey Turkish <laughs> rice. Now, we can't eat them now. We'll have to wait for a little bit longer. OK. I look forward to it. My rice pudding is a dessert delight. Try it out on the kids with different flavoured jams. It's been great to make new friends who have helped me create some wonderful dishes today. Mark and Verity helped me find just the right pumpkin flavour for my cheesecake. Mel taught me how to make Turkish delight and we made our family rice puddings. Robert and Alison brought their exotic herbs and spices all the way from Yorkshire, of course. We've cooked some great dishes today. I think it's now time to finally eat them. Um, so tuck in, guys. Take what you want. Don't yeah. worry about sweet starters. Just take whatever you want. Thai chicken pie seems a good place to start. It's good, isn't it? When you, oh, sorry, when, you, when you taste the pie yeah. like that, it's Thai, definitely. But then yes. it's got that huge English, British influence. Yes, here, isn't it? definitely. You get that fresh coriander seed in there. It's coming through <laughs> from Yorkshire. <laughs> all Lancashire, all Merseyside. Next, the rice puddings. It's so different, but they're, they're actually both very, very good. Yeah. Um, so, Mel, which 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 you like? Do you the I rice love puddings? Yours. That's so you like mine? That's I so quite like yours, yours, actually. I must admit, eating cold rice pudding, I thought was going to be a little bit difficult, yeah. <laughs> but it's really good. The texture, actually. that's fantastic. Yes, it is. They're both really delicious. Finally, those super sweet pumpkin cheesecakes. I'm loving the ginger with the pumpkin. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's really tasty. But it's your pumpkin. Actually, not. Didn't I... know we could do this with our pumpkins. <laughs> but with the ginger and that biscuit base. It works really well together, so I'm really surprised. The big yeah, plate there, <laughs> This is what I love, sharing hearty food with friends. I hope you can join me again next time when I'll have more pies and puds on the menu. See you then.